Hey, good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. I don't know where everybody's logging in from, but I guess in central time, it would be good afternoon. Um, I want to welcome everybody to uh, our tutorial this, this evening. Um, and also thank everybody for participating in the this virtual M&M &M meeting. I know it's uh, been a little bit different than normal, but it's actually been pretty, pretty good. Uh, we've, I've learned a lot. So uh, uh, this evening, we're going to work on some spectrum image data processing. So we have uh, quite a bit, quite a few new features in GMS 3.4 for processing data. And, um, and there's also some sort of hidden tips and tricks, things that kind of don't, they make it in the manual, but they don't get advertised too well. So Liam, who's, a, who's an expert in analyzing data and knows all the ins and outs, is gonna run through a couple of different scenarios for us so that we can uh, see some of these new features and maybe learn some uh, new, tip, new tips and tricks. Um, this is a tutorial format, so if you do want to uh, unmute yourself and ask some questions, uh, go right ahead. Um, and we'll just uh, we'll roll with the punches as it goes. All right, so I want to hand over things over to uh, Liam. Yeah, Liam, take it away. Great. Uh, just before I start talking a lot, can you hear my audio? Yeah. Yeah, you sound great. Great. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so this is the, the workshop that we prepared. It's basically spectrum imaging, spectrum imaging processing. So I'm going to cover a bunch of processing tools. So loosely, uh, it will be elemental mapping for eels, uh, model-based, uh, standards-based. We'll look at some 4D stem, uh, look at the linear least squares tool, so multilinear least squares fitting, nonlinear least squares fitting and finally kind of finish on the multivariate statistical analysis tool, so some PCA right at the end. And that's all gonna be done through kind of three uh, worked examples. So the first data set is a copper oxide uh, experiment that was an in-situ heating experiment. And then we're looking at some FIB sections, so a multi-layer strontium titanate, barium titanate, and finally a film of bismuth therite and iridium. So uh, let's jump to GMS. So yeah, okay, so this is the, the copper data. We're gonna start with the copper data. So this experiment, we had uh, some drop cast copper two oxide particles just on lacy carbon film. And it was a heating experiment uh, done between room temperature and about 600 Celsius. So I did approximately 10 increments of temperature, but for the purpose of demonstration, we're just going to look at three of them. So we have a 27C spectrum image, uh, 350C, and 500C. And then I've just uh, also included a stack of HADAF images just to show you what happened to the particle as it was heated. So this, this slice that we're looking at here um, is the room temperature, or, yeah, low temperature, so room temperature. And then as we go up to high temperature, you can see like some small changes in microstructure. And then at some point, there's this big change. So this, this slice here is 350 Celsius that we're looking at. And this is 400 Celsius, and then 500, 600. And then there's a, a blank one at the end. So we see in the HADAF images, we see a whole bunch of interesting changes in microstructure. So the, the shape of the particle completely changes. And then we get areas where the Z contrast increases a lot. So now there's a quite a lot going on. So it's kind of interesting once we've looked at the image data to then go and see what we can get from analytical, to so see what we can get from eels. So these, if anyone's not familiar uh, with the new way that the data is managed, this is what we call a compound uh, data object. So you can store uh, things like spectrum images now in these compound data objects. So this has the SEM survey image, uh, the low loss spectrum image, the high loss spectrum image all in the same uh, object. But we could split that out into kind of the components if we wanted to. So kind of the first thing, the first shortcut that we'll see, we'll look at that. So this is a copper oxide particle. Let's just actually check that it's copper, copper oxide. So to do that, we could look at the high loss uh, spectrum image. So one useful shortcut, if you hold down the control key and left click and drag on a spectrum image, 
the software will automatically select user picker tool basically. So we're going to select and sum energy loss spectra from this uh, this region that I have here. So you can see in the actual spectrum, we've got uh, oxygen K edge. So and we have a copper L edge. So we're already fairly happy. We have, we have the right elements. So the first thing that might might be useful to do is just see in what ratio they are. So we, we expect the copper and the oxygen to be in a one to one ratio. So if we did quantification, we'd expect 50 uh, 50. So it looks like I've already added elements to the list here. If we wanted to do that ourselves, you would you could either draw a marker on with the left click, then right click. And then this is add to quant feature. So you can that's more useful if you don't know what's in the sample. So you can kind of data mine, add to this quantification list over here in the elemental quantification palette, or you could just use the periodic table. So if we click on the periodic table, we can throw in elements that we uh, think are in our sample or know that are in our sample. So we have oxygen, we have copper. So if I just want to do a quantification, I can do quantification with the basic. So this is model-based quantification. So we have these red regions are the power law kind of background fit regions. And for the ionization edges, we're using Hartree Slater cross-section models at the moment. So this is the default kind of default parameters. So I hit quant and then you get the answers. So we get a quantification result for this extracted spectrum in the results window. So you can see we've got something that is ballpark 50-50 oxygen copper, which I'm happy with that. So we could do that in a different way instead of just um, doing the quantification for the single spectrum, we could do a map. So we can go ahead and do elemental composition. So I'm going to get a composition map for copper and oxygen. Get our maps. And then we have the, the two composition maps. So one thing, yeah, that I wanted to show you another kind of new shortcut that's quite simple. Maybe people are aware, maybe not. If you draw a line profile across something, so I'm picking this little feature here because it's actually not over any carbon. So it's just going to be, it should just be copper and oxygen. So I'm using the plus key there to increase the integration width of this line profile tool. But then the main thing I wanted to show you was if you want to just, if you just drag this line profile onto another image, another map, the software will mirror these two line profiles. So that's a newish feature. And then what I'm looking for is the region here. So if I draw an ROI on this line profile, so you can see this kind of dashed box, then that's marked on the line profile region. So that's, that's quite a generic feature in GMS. It's really useful to kind of see uh, where we are on the actual image in this line profile. So again, uh, if we look at the profile, it's composition on the edges is a bit kind of sketchy, but in the middle, uh, we have again, 50-50 for the copper and the oxygen. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. Uh, okay, so what else do we want to look at? So I'll go back, close these guys down. So survey. Oh, actually, one other thing that I wanted to cover. So if we, so there's actually another way. This is kind of not related to the rest of the quantification, but there is a kind of a really super easy, fast way to do mapping uh, for eels. So we can. We control left uh, click on the spectrum. We put our background window. Control left click and drag again, and you get the signal window. And then if you right click in this kind of signal ROI that's there, you have this feature that says map signal dynamic. So then that basically gives you the integrated intensity in this, uh, this region of our extracted ionization edge. Uh, it's dynamic, so if we were to make changes to this guy or the spectrum, basically if we change the fit windows, the map gets updated. So you can optimize the map. You can see it's 
bad now. The statistics are terrible because my window is too small. And it helps you place uh, your window. So both the signal and the background, you can avoid overlapping edges and things like that. If you wanted to just grab a snapshot of that image or that map whilst leaving it live, if you press Control C to copy that image, and then there's a shortcut, which is the Control key, the Alt key, and the V key all together, then you paste uh, into a new image window. And then we can basically move around. So you could leave this live, essentially, and then extract maps as you go. So one thing that's quite nice about the dynamic map feature is that this is a free. This is in the free version of GMS. Uh, anything that involves the, the cross sections uh, using this elemental quantification palette need the the full analytical license. So if you don't have that and you just have the free license and you want to do some fast, easy mapping, this dynamic uh, mapping tool is the way to go. Uh, so it's. It's in this kind of sub menu. If you right click in the spectrum, it's also in the SI uh, menu up here. So SI map signal dynamic. Okay, so that's that's that one. Minimize those guys. Okay. And then, okay, so you can see all of these guys here say aligned. So 27C aligned, 350C aligned, 500C aligned. So that means I've, well, I labeled them myself, but so what my labeling is there means that I have corrected any energy shift, any energy drift. So we have dual alleles data sets here. All of them are dual alleles. So we have low loss data, uh, ZLP. So the, the whole point of the alliance, so we have this, basically you need to draw an ROI over your ZLP and the software can run, make some measurement and do some correction. So we would do that in the SI menu. So there's this feature SI, there's a function in the SI menu that says align SI by peak. But I've already run that, so I don't really want to run it again. But it's, if I draw this ROI, onto the spectrum and then I move uh, around. If you kind of, you can see that as a marker, that, that zero loss peak is always at the same channel. So the any energy drift is basically corrected, removed. Yeah, and that's important if you want to make measure kind of an, measure fine structure and a chemical shift, you really want to have the energy scale accurately characterized. So the final thing that I wanted to show you, so we covered the picker tool, um, looking at this low loss spectrum image. So there's the picker tool we use to extract the spectral data. So this is a sum of the energy loss spectra from this particular subregion that I've uh, selected. There's also another tool that we use called the slice tool. So this is, remember that these are multi-dimensional data sets. So this EELS data is three dimensions, so that we have two spatial axes and an energy loss axis. So the way that we kind of probe the energy lo loss axis is using this other tool, which is called Slice. So that's over on the left-hand side in the display uh, tab over here. So you've got two sliders. Uh, one is an energy position and one is an energy width. So you can see the contrast changes in that, uh, you know, the, the raster image of our spectrum image. A really nice way to kind of make that much more interpretable is to first of all select the spectrum which has been extracted from that spectrum image and then you have this this extra checkbox appears which is called show a range so show range actually just shows you the slice that we are integrating over so with this data set it's low loss so if i put the slice over the zero loss peak you have something that looks like bright field contrast. And then if we have uh, our picker region or our slice, in an inelastic region, the contrast is inverted. So it kind of looks a bit like dark field contrast. So you can see what we see um, here is interpretable, makes sense. If you have a data set with lots of different ionization edges in, this is a good way to survey the data. You can use this slice tool to sweep through the data and look for where you have changes in brightness 
in your spectrum image and then move the picker tool to those regions and using those two tools together in uh, parallel is a really fast way to look through the data. It doesn't really show super amount with this sample because I have just copper and oxygen and carbon, but for more elements, it's much more useful. Okay, so that's so that's that one. So okay, so let's kind of now move into actually looking at these ionization edges. So the whole point was that we the idea here is that we expect some change in the oxidation state of the copper due to vacuum annealing. So we expected to start off the copper two. And then we were hoping to see reduction, so a decrease in oxidation state to one plus, uh, maybe zero. So to do that uh, analysis, we want to look at the high loss region. And we want to look at the copper LT3 edge. So I'm going to switch from the low loss spectrum to the high loss spectrum. I could just yeah, look at this guy and you're going to make it a bit smaller. Actually, I want to compare these two, not that one. So I'll do the same thing for the 350 and the 500. So high loss, let's make it a bit smaller and do the same thing. There we go. Okay, so another kind of useful feature digital micrograph. If you have spectrum images that are the same size and you draw one of these picker regions on uh, you know, some region you're interested in, if you then basically drag this picker into the another, to the other spectrum image, you end up with these mirrored uh, picker objects. So you can have extracted data from the same uh, pixel regions. In this case, uh, you can see that th there's not good spatial correlation between the, the data, but I, you know, I could have done some drift correct, drift alignment. Remember, these are acquired at different times. But just for a comparison of the chemistry, kind of the overall chemistry in this one versus this one, this is, this is pretty useful. So yeah, I want to look first of all at this guy. So if I wanted to just look at the ionization edge by itself, you left click and drag. You can just then hide all of the other slices. So hide all others. So we can just look at the extracted copper. So this kind of looks like copper one character, I think. The room temperature, if we did the same, is very much more copper two character. So you have really strong, um, much stronger white lines in the, in the room temperature sample than the 350C sample. And then if you go ahead and do the same thing for the high temperature sample, then it looks, well, this one looks characteristic of metal. So you have even less intensity in the white lines. Okay, so these two are mirrored. Uh, let's show them all again. Show all slices. So these two are mirrored, so I can I'm basically moving them around. You'll see that both of those spectra change. So a neat way of kind of actually, we, you know, we can line these up and kind of look at them, but it might be nice to actually have one on top of the other. So how do we do that? So there's another neat trick, another neat tool. So if I select these two, and this is actually a script function at the moment, uh, but you can just install the script file if this is something that you wanted to do. So it's this tool to link these picker objects. So we can link that high loss and that high loss. And then we end up with the two overlaid. So you can move them around. Okay, so another shortcut that I tend to use quite a lot, if you press Control D, it takes you straight to the image info. So I tend to find it uh, easier to give these images or these slices sensible names. 
So if you press Control D, and then you can either rename the whole image. I don't really need to rename the whole image. I just want to rename the slices that I've overlaid here. So you go to line plot, and then this is yeah this is new I think in three four. So you have the slices fairly easily accessed here. Um, so we can choose the first spectrum, change the name. That is the 350C spectrum. The second one is the 500C. And update. And then you end up, so if you right click on the, the spectrum, display, show legend, then you have the slices with kind of meaningful names rather than something that just says spectrum and slice one, for example. So I find, you know, my personal choice is to just name them as you go, because otherwise you can get a little lost. You might think that you remember which slice is which, but after looking up loads of them, they inevitably all look the same. Okay, so these guys update. Um, so we can kind of by eye see that there's some differences, but if you want to make uh, more of a kind of easier comparison, if you draw an ROI over anywhere, so I'm going to use the oxygen pre-edge region. If I select both of these, so I hold the shift key, left click on the two entries in the legend up here, you end up with a solid uh, outline, so I know they're both selected. Right click. And then you've got a line sliced vertically by. So I'm going to choose integral, and that will normalize the two slices against this pre-edge intensity integral. So that makes it easier to kind of compare these two, um, two spectra. So we have uh, less oxygen intensity in one. And we're expecting the oxygen to be removed from the sample. So that gives you some kind of idea of what's happening. In, and then we have a change. It looks like we have a change in kind of relative peak intensity of these two compared to kind of this post white line region in the ionization edge. So everything's really pointing towards a uh, change in oxidation state. We see, you know, strong changes in the copper LT3 fine structure supported with a reduction in intensity in the oxygen K edge. So it looks like metal character copper where there's less or no oxygen. Okay, so that's all uh, kind of spectra and just kind of regular mapping. But this is kind of leads nicely into the next uh, feature that I wanted to show you, which was the mapping with standards. So it would be nice if we could, you know, we know that we have copper zero, we know that we have copper one and copper two. It would be nice if we could pull out some maps of the different oxidation states. So the way that we can do that is with this new eels with standards feature. And um, OK, so first of all, you need to have some standards. So it depends kind of what you're doing. This sort, this experiment, you would probably want to have external references. So we'd, I, my references for the mapping, I use this this uh, powder, so I use the copper two powder, it's commercial powder, uh, copper one oxide powder, and then some metal region from a semiconductor device for the, for the zero plus reference. So the, the, way that we, the way that we import the references, we need to, I always preferentially have a dual yields data set, you'll see why in a second. So we, Basically, you need to extract uh, some color spectrum. You tag an edge in the spectrum. So it looks like it's already there for some reason. Yeah. So the copper L is already there. So basically, if I want to add a copper reference, I need to add copper to the spectrum as one of these elemental signals. Then you have this small little triangle at the bottom here. And if you click on the triangle, it gives you an expanded menu. You've got two buttons here. One that says measure standard and one says edit standard. So if I say measure standard, then the first thing the software asks us to do is draw, uh, basically we need to have an extractive spectrum. So we need to define some background window. So you want to have a 
good sized background window. Hit OK. So this is the point where dual eels becomes useful. So it says plural scattering can be removed from the standard using Fourier ratio deconvolution. So obviously the having the zero loss peak is good because uh, it means that we're confident with the energy scale. So we can say, okay, the energy is accurately defined, but by having the whole low loss spectrum, we're able to do this ratio deconvolution. So we end up with a single scattering distribution standard, which is a bit more versatile and useful than without. So you get the option to do the deconvolution or not. If you have the option, I would always say yes. I've summed over multiple pixels to offset the fact that when you do the ratio deconvolution, you're going to add some noise. So I say perform the deconvolution. Then we then kind of have some parameters for the standard. So you've got the option to keep for this session only. I tend not to do that and write to disk. It gets saved to uh, kind of the settings folder. Give it some um, name. So copper two and then maybe some notes. So you could say multiple of spectrum image like uh, dual eels or something like that. So it should automatically import the convergence in the collection angle from the data, uh, beam energy, things like that. And then you define the range. So I tend to make the range big enough that the, so what, what's happening here is uh, the, there's, kind of in two parts. You have the experimental uh, reference part, which is where you can see that this is kind of has some noise. And then that experimental edge shape, so uh, is at some point spliced onto a hard tree slater cross section shape. So you can see if I decrease the size, then this part where there's no noise, and it's perfect, is a calculated cross section. So you can kind of see where we're at. But you get to a point where if you keep going, then the fit gets worse and worse and worse, as we'd expect, because we're not modeling the Elnes. That's the whole reason we usually don't include the Elnes in EELS quantification. So I tend to go for a region where this starts to then, the Hartree Slater part of the cross section starts to kind of converge with the real edge shape. And that's kind of my rule of thumb. I'm not going to save that because I already have the ref references imported for copper, uh, copper zero, one, and two. So, okay, so how do we use it? So that's how you import the standard. How do we then go and use the standard? So it's pretty straightforward. Once you've imported some standards, if you're in the elemental quantification, uh, you just go to the edge setup, which is this sigma button over on the right hand side, open analysis setup. And then we choose our parameters, right? So we're choosing a background model, which is in the energy range. So you can see here, we have this exclude Elnes button. And we usually have this switched on because the fit is not very good in the Elnes region because the Elnes isn't calculated by these basic cross-section shapes. So now if I go down to the cross-section model at the bottom of the dialog and open up kind of the options here it's as well so if you look at the bottom we now have standard the reason standard um is a choice is because there are some copper standards that i have imported or created so if i choose standard so the standard that's uh, the first in the copper list is actually the metal so even the metal you can see fits uh, better uh, most of the edge it doesn't fit the white lines but we wouldn't expect it to because this is the copper two region and we're using a copper zero standard so, okay, what can we do next? So we can go into this little three dots button and we can choose a uh, standard. So I have three standards. These are the notes. Uh, so I would choose the two. Okay. And then you can see it's not perfect for this region, but it's uh, considerably better than the calculated cross section. And yes, it's probably because I'm summing over uh, some vacuum region and throwing off the deconvolution a bit. But if I sum just over the actual sample. The fit's very, very good. And then you can see how it deals with the plural scattering pretty well. So because we have this single scattering distribution standard, so works pretty, so see how it's accurately reconstructed. Basically the shape's 
well characterized in the thin region with pleural scattering off. But then if you go into the bulk of this particle, then that fit becomes worse. If we switch the pleural scattering correction back on, so basically this model or this kind of edge shape that we're using is then convolved with the low loss spectrum point by point, then the fit is way, way better, which is what we want. Okay, so the advantage uh, here, um, before we even kind of do anything to do with the oxidation state is we are now, the fit's way better because we're able to fit uh, in a region that we couldn't fit before. So a better fit that directly kind of relates to better quantification. And we're also getting more signals. So we're kind of win-win. Now, okay, so I was talking about the different oxidation states. So to do, so do something more than just a single standard, we go in here and there's this other choice, multi-selection. So if I enable multi-selection, you can select um, multiple standards. So we say plus, plus, and then we have our three references. So I'm going to use all three references, hit OK. And then now if you kind of look up, uh, up in that kind of a legend of this, uh, this spectrum here, we've got copper standard one, copper standard two, copper standard three. So it's mostly copper two, so it's going to be predominantly one of these references, but you can see that the software is using all three references. So if I then press just exit out of this menu, I could save that. Um, demo params. So I can save that edge setup. And we could do map. Let's do, uh, let's just stick with signal integral maps for now. Signal integrals. Oh, no, let's do volumetric. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. okay. So we have three volumetric density maps for the three standards. So, okay, so they're all the same color at the moment. Um, hardly any zero. Uh, looks like there is maybe some one plus, um, but by all kind of shadow of a doubt, there's mostly, mostly um, two plus. So we could use the color mix tool to do an RGB composite of these three. Uh, add, so one, two, three. Should items use the identical color in the mixed image? Uh, we want it to basically recolor those. And have our RGB, RGB map. So, okay, so I'm not sure which color is which at the moment. There's a nice uh, feature in color mix where you can colorize the source images. So if we colorize this, this little button here that says uh, source, you can colorize uh, source images. I actually prefer it to be blue for copper two, red for copper one, and green for metal. That's the color scheme I use in the raw data. So that is the, again, so this is why I rename as I go along, because you end up with loads of images that will be the same name. So I'm going to say uh, RGB all dense um, 27C. And then you could also say CU2 blue CU1. Okay. Okay, so that's the RGB oh. composite. Um, what else can we do? So we've recolor, we've colorized the source images, and you can see how I can, if you just click, you can change the colors. For this kind of example, red, green, blue makes the most sense. We've only got three components, and they are all overlapping, so those are the colors we should use. Uh, what else can you do? So there's this other feature for color mix where you can use the line profile. 
This is kind of different to a regular line profile. So it works on RGB images and you get a kind of triple line profile, I would say, which is really handy if you want to kind of measure changes in intensity of the three components and have them overlaid. So you can see how we uh, basically yeah, the intensity profile of, of the three oxidation states over this particle. So at room temperature, this, yeah, mostly copper two, but it would be interesting kind of at the higher temperatures to look perhaps at the edges of the particles. This would be a really useful way to see if you had, uh, you know, like a shell of a different oxidation state on a core of another oxidation state. Hey, just a quick comment on that, Liam. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the difference with this line profile tool than a regular RGB line profile tool is this line profile tool actually takes the data from the original images and displays the line profile in the appropriate color rather than just showing the R, G, and B channels. So it's, um, it's a way of actually looking at the quantitative data that's already been mixed into the, the RGB color colors I just wanted to clarify that. Mm -hmm. So it'll be it'll be more fun when you do the other ones that actually are have multiple uh, uh, oxidation states. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. That's a good point. So I've actually um, pre-saved the other maps because I thought just in to save time, well, you didn't really want to. You know, you've seen how to generate the map. You don't need to see me do that uh, three times. So, um, okay, so these are the, the, it's basically the same data uh, for the same sample, the uh, same guys. So we've got 500C on the right, 350 on in the middle, 27 there. So actually, yeah, I don't think we can do that anymore uh, because I've saved them. They're no, that, it's no longer linked. Um, what do you think, Ray? Should we <laughs> process them all again or just move on? I can't, I can't, don't think I can use the, do what you just. Sh yeah, no, we, we get the idea. It's, um, yeah. okay. Yeah, it, it has to be an active uh, color mix map. Yeah. So, yeah, so these, this is the, the results for this experiment. So you've got a trend, uh, basically most, majority is two plus at the beginning. Then you have kind of uh, some reduction to one plus in the kind of mid temperature range and then at the highest temperatures, you start to form. You basically have almost no uh, no copper two at all, and it's all copper one and copper zero. So there was one final thing I wanted to show you on this data set. So this is actually set similar data from a wildfire holder. So the pixel density is not super high in these. Um, these ones here to the left. That was done intentionally because I did 40 STEM at the same time. And you end up with crazy, crazy big data sets if you have um, uh, loads and loads of pixels. It's just a bit data intensive. And so I also limited the number of uh, temperature slices. So we only had 10 temperature slices and a lower pixel density in the spectrum images. But with this, this is a similar experiment with a wildfire holder where the temperature resolution per, per slice. Yeah. They, okay, there we go. I'm not distracted anymore. <laughs> Sorry about that. So it's fine. So, okay, so we've got higher temperature resolution here in this data. It's 4C per slice, and it's from 150, no, 100 to 600, or so no, 100 to 700 C. This is it's 150 slices at four uh, degrees C per slice, and you can just see by eye that the the pixel density is higher as well. So, um, like 512 by 535, as opposed to this is uh, way smaller. Uh, but this allows you to you can kind of create this stack like I did with that. Hadaf data, and this is kind of cool. So you've got the RGB here is green. Green is actually oxygen in this data because we had silica mixed in with the copper oxide. So green is oxygen, 
Uh, blue is copper two, red is copper zero. So you sweep through this. So this is kind of fun. You see these kind of cool changes in, you see basically nice changes in microstructure that you can correlate with changes in chemistry at the same time in this higher temperature resolution data. So we could essentially do the same thing uh, with this data, um, with the other data as this data, but it doesn't make um, as much sense if you don't have as many slices, I'd, I'd say. So yeah, at least squares fitting tool. So this is a fib section of strontium titanate, barium titanate. Uh, it's on a silicon substrate. So we've got silicon on the left. Uh, the strontium titanate layer, I think, is this one. And then we have barium titanate uh, off to the right. So we have, in this data, we've got low loss eels, high loss eels, so it's dual eels. And then we also have EDS. So I'm going to grab, use the picker tool and extract a spectrum from this region here. And then um, extract the signal spectrum again. And then just, we've got the titanium LT3 edge, oxygen K edge. So you can see just if we look at the data, we've got changes in fine structure in both these edges. So you oxygen changes, titanium changes, and then the titanium goes away, uh, as, we'd, as we'd hope in our silicon substrate. There also is, if you look at the low loss and the if you look at the low loss, we actually have the silicon edge as well. So you've got your silicon L edge in the low loss data. And you can, if you look closely at this data, you see that there's actually a region that where we have silicon and still some titanium and oxygen. So it looks like there's an oxide layer at the surface of the silicon and maybe some titanium as well. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff going on. So another way that we can do mapping is with, yeah, so basically we want to see if we can map, make, um, map that out. So another way we can do mapping is using this least squares fitting tool. So it has two uh, flavors. You've got MLLS, which multilinear least squares fitting. So there we're fitting uh, fixed uh, references. So it's a linear combination of fixed uh, reference spectra that we put in or you can use simulated spectra or uh, experimental spectra. non the least squares uh, fitting, we're fitting parameterized uh, functions. So we'll start off with MLLS. So the way the new tool uh, works, you can, we've got two ways of grabbing data. So one is if we can grab data from the data set itself, which is called using internal references. So I'm going to look at uh, just the high loss. Or you can um, use external references. So for this data, we've got really fairly well segregated phases. So I can use internal references. So I've got my background and signal here, because I just used the shortcut with the control left drag. So what we want to do is we basically have our kind of extracted uh, spectrum, so the edge in the background. You click on this little guy here, the arrow button, it says add reference from front spectrum. And then it will ask you what references that you want to add. So the, you've got three choices because there's three slices in the data. I want to use the background slice and the edge slice. And then um, we can then give some background, it'll assume you want to name background. And then you choose the name of the other slice. Then you can also choose the fit region. So I'll limit the fit region just to have the titanium. So what you can see now is this 1D fit feature has become engaged. So that's switched on, it means it's doing a live fit. So at the moment, the fit is is perfect because this is the reference. So this, the raw spectrum is the same as the reference that we use. But then as you 
as we move around, you can then see how the fit improves or gets worse. So we kind of expect it to get worse, and it does. So that makes sense because we've just moved into a region where we have a different uh, different edge shape for the titanium. So our STO fit is, uh, you know, that reference doesn't fit fit the data. So there's two ways that you can use the tool to uh, kind of give you this visual visual aid. So you, you want to have 1D fit switched on and you can look at the residual. So where you start to get a high residual will give you an indication that you have a fit component missing. You can also have the total fit displayed, which is it's kind of similar. So we can switch total fit on as a display option in live display here. It's just, you've got these various options, total fit, residual, individual fits, et cetera. So I usually use the total fit and the residuals to give you an idea of uh, when we wanna add another component. So if you wanna add another component, uh, switch the 1D fit off and then do the same thing again. Uh, we could do the same. Again, I could have background and edge. BTO and then you switch the 1D fit on again. So fit there is good. Uh, fit here is good. Then we want to concentrate on the interface area. So I tend to look at the low loss and see where we have the silicon. think that's our other component of, so we want to switch the 1D fit off again. And then we can do the same thing again. So we can throw in another reference. So 1D fit, no, not 1D fit, wrong. Uh, background and edge. I know that, that is three plus and then 1D fit. So we can look through and then if you're happy with the uh, references and the MLLS fit range, then we can hit map. Uh, I'm going to hide the background maps and just show the, uh, the STO, the BTO, and then this interface layer. So we've got uh, three maps, you can use color mix again and do the same thing. So yeah, so you've only got these three maps. Uh, so another way that you can populate the uh, the fit list here is there's this little button um, with the question mark and the three lines. And then that allows you to kind of pull in external references. So by external references, I just mean uh, references from different kind of open data. So you can, you can basically import anything that's open in the software that the software recognizes as the Neil spectrum, the, the, the appropriate spectrum. Okay, so that's... Yeah, um, yeah that's great. So yeah, the, uh, the, the, the backgrounds, I guess, are also fitting over in the silicon where there is no titanium. So then that just gives you a nice even background. Correct. Yeah. So to let yeah. you know, uh, we're, we're getting on about uh, 50 minutes now. So... Um, uh, Okay, I'll uh, I'll accelerate my talking. Yeah, okay, so then I wanted to just move on to kind of a, one more example with this sample. So there we're fitting the whole edge shape. Titanium actually has these interesting satellite peaks on the uh, kind of the L line. So you've got the L3 and the L2, so you have this split line. Then you also have this kind of sub peaks due to crystal field splitting. So the the energy separation of these peaks actually kind of tells you about the chemistry and the structure, kind of the local chemistry for the titanium. So another way to approach the mapping is with nonlinear least squares fitting. So we could do nonlinear least squares. So the way nonlinear least squares works is we pick something that we want to fit to. You click on this guy and then you choose a fit, fit model. So one of the big things in GMS 3.4 that's changed is this list of available models is, is way, way, way more extensive. So you've got, uh, we used to just have Gaussian, now we have 
all of these other models. You can even add um, scripted function. So if you want to have a custom function, you can add that in or a reference. So a reference is like a, a fixed uh, reference. By using a reference here, it's kind of like a hybrid of MLLS fitting and NLS, L, NNL, LS fitting at the same time. So that's pretty, that can be pretty useful. So the, the fit that I've done here actually pre-saved. So we're running out of time. So if I open my fit for this, I am fitting, uh, so one of the fit models I have is power law over this region. And then I'm fitting Lorentzians to the four peaks on the L3, uh, the L3 and the L2 lines. You can do uh, useful stuff like rename them. I've renamed the L3 A, uh, B. You can constrain uh, any of the kind of, any. you can constrain certain parameters for the models. So that's useful. So we can again use the total fit to check that the fit is good. It looks pretty good. And yeah, so it's basically you have this really useful live 1D fit thing. So something that kind of is a new feature that's pretty cool. I'm actually only interested in uh, the direction here perpendic uh, perpendicular to the interface. So a way of increasing my signal to noise ratio, if I wanted to just map in that direction, you can draw a line profile, then increase the integration width. Then if I then right click on the edge of this extracted region, we have this function that says extract line scan SI. So that allows you to extract a line profile spectrum image from the 2D array. That's, so that's really useful, especially if you're interested in interfaces, you want to kind of effectively bin uh, in certain directions. This allows you to do that. So I can extract the, basically select the high loss spectrum. Um, let's go to the titanium. Let's do the same thing again. So I'm going to load my map, that one, the mapping parameters. You know, it's the nonlinear least squares that we want. So we load that one and then just hit map and output. So then I'll end up with a bunch of line profiles. And so I actually did that already. So we, we can, did I? Yeah, so the NLS results. So essentially I'm interested in the difference in um, the peak position uh, L3A and L3B. So, and that gives you this crystal field splitting energy. So well, you can just use the simple math or a script. You just basically go up here, process, uh, simple math, choose the two uh, images or line profiles that you're interested in and just subtract one from the other. So the result on plot I ended up with is this one. And so we end up with a crystal field energy in the STI of around 2.3 and a crystal field splitting or crystal field energy in the BTO, which is less. So this answers are fairly consistent with what I found in literature. So it's kind of a nice alternative technique for fitting. So that's MLLS fitting and NLS fitting. So there's some kind of cool, cool things that you can do with both. Do we have time, Ray, for the PCA, or do we need to drop? Sure, that? why not? All right, fine. Okay, so final example is using the multivariate tool, so PCA. This sample is another fib section. So we have on the left uh, strontium titanate, and then we have. So you've got your titanium LH oxygen, and we have. Um, the strontium LH. And then we've got bismuth ferrite. So you've got the bismuth MH over here on the high energy around 2600. Iron L oxygen K. And then you've got this iridium layer. Uh, so we have our iridium MH here. So yeah, so we've got the, the multivariate tool. So it has a few different features. So you've got denoise, uh, decompose, and vary max. So we'll walk through those in turn. 
So the PCA decomp. So the yeah. So first of all, uh, PCA decomposition. So if you run the PCA decomp. So essentially, when we're doing PCA, it's we kind of getting modeling our data uh, with what we call principal components. If you kind of, and we end up with uh, two matrices. So we have a scores matrix and a loadings matrix and a scree plot. So okay. So I'll go back to zero. So this is the scores, the loadings. So essentially the scores is the spatial distribution of the loadings and the loadings are our principal components in essence. So they're basically, yeah, we're measuring the variance and then the variance from the variance and so on. So, okay, if we go through these, we're basically looking for components that have strong variance and at the point that that variance then kind of becomes just noise, you can kind of see at this component five, everything is noise and we have loads of components. So we've actually limited the, in the, the software limits the components to hundred, but you can see that we can fairly accurately represent this data set with just four components. Uh, it looked like that fifth component was a cosmic ray that hit the, uh, Oh uh, yeah, over here. Yeah, often you want to de-spike uh, de the data before you analyze mm. it, but that's good. Just showing how, how it picks out that. Yeah. So yeah, this is K3 data. Um, so we don't have any instrumentation or noise, it's just uh, shot noise. So kind of one of the real, uh, and also we have a fairly uniform sample. So this is actually really well behaved data set. So you can look at the uh, look at the scores and we look for where we uh, it just becomes noise but you can also use the scree plot so the scree plot is essentially like eigenvalues of the principal components in order of significance so what we're looking for in the scree plot is we're looking for the an inflection point at which the uh, the eigenvalues kind of become linear so this is a really <laughs> good uh, scree plot. This is super obvious um, where the noise component, where everything's just pure noise. We've got a very, very, very sharp inflection point. And that's a combination of this nice thin uniform sample and using a very uh, well-behaved detector. So, okay, so we could say let's, we're only interested in a few of these components. Uh, where did my slice tool go? So we were interested in just these guys. So yeah, these have strong variants, but in terms of actually interpreting these, it's, it's a little tricky. There's like massive, massive negative intensity. So something that we can do is use this Verimax. So if you click uh, Verimax on the PCA decomposed data, it'll ask you how many components you want to keep. And it'll do some rotation in spatial or signal domain. So if we rotate in the spatial domain, it will give you principal, basically makes the, is some constraint where our components become non-negative. So what you end up with is principal components or that look much, they're interpretable. They look like actual energy loss spectra. So we've got, and we have the phase, the, yeah, the four phase, the phases that we have here. So we have uh, yeah, one phase, the other phase, and the other phase. So we can do the same with the scores. So that's the platinum layer, I think. Uh, iridium, bismuth ferrite, and tritium titanate. <laughs> like, wow, well, what is it? Yeah. So the the Final thing that you can do with the uh, with the MSA tool is do the simple denoise. So if you do a simple denoise, essentially the software will just do the decomposition, but it won't keep the decomposition. It will ask you how many principal components that you want to use in a reconstruction, and then it'll do the reconstruction. So I actually already did this. So we've got the denoise data here. So if we have uh, just a single pick. Yeah, so that we can choose uh, delete that guy. Oh my gosh, I'm confused. It's just... 
Yeah, so I can again use the fact that we can link these picker objects. If I um, drag, yeah, so you've got a single pixel, same single pixel. Okay, and so yeah, and the effect of the denoising is pretty nice. Yeah, the simple denoising is just sort of like uh, it just it just cuts off at a particular value. There's also the recombine tool where you can choose whichever components you want. So if you say you want to eliminate a, a specific component that has to do with a, a, a spike or something like that, you can leave that out of the analysis. Yeah. So I think that's well, brilliant. pretty much what I went. I went a bit, yeah. uh, a bit fast perhaps through the last one, but that's the... And uh, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show with this data. Yeah, so I also should say that this uh, MSA tool is actually an ad adaptation of the tool written at EPFL by uh, Guillaume Lucas and Cecile Herbert's group. So they uh, uh, worked with us on uh, implementing or transferring that over to Digital Micrograph so that uh, everybody can use it. And that's available on the free version of Digital Micrograph online as well. All right, I well, guess great. one thing that I would probably just wanted to close on is that all of these processing tools, so the analytical, like the elemental analysis, and uh, the eels with standards, the nonlinear least squares, multilinear least squares, PCA, you could do all of these on any of the data. So you, you could come up with like a hybrid methods. So it's quite convenient to just say, oh, well, I could do some denoise and then I want to do some I could then go and do some elemental mapping using the eels tools on the same data or the processed data. You don't, you don't need to think, oh, I, ha I can only use this one or I can only use this one. And you can, hopefully you can see from the fact that we just kind of flew over this in like just an hour. It doesn't take a whole lot of time to, because all of the processing tools is in the same application and work on the same data objects and everything. You can you don't necessarily lose too much time to say, oh, am I going to get a better result with this one or this one? You can kind of, you know, pick and choose, and I would say, yeah. I don't know if that's any help. Well, great. So we, um, I mean, we have a couple of questions coming in over the chat box, but if anybody does have any questions live, um, you let us know. Um, what, one of the uh, questions on the chat was if recommending standards over PCA. And they're kind of related, right? I mean, standards are one way of, uh, you know, our pre-knowledge. You know ahead of time that this is a 2 plus and a 3 plus, and you're fitting it to that known information, whereas PCA pulls the information out, and then you would then interpret that information that you pulled out rather than looking for something, you're asking the question, what is there? Yeah. But you can use them both ways. You can use the PCA data to, to then create your standards and use that to do your quantification. Hmm. Yeah, they're definitely complementary. Yeah. It's like PCA will help for noisy, I guess, noisy data, but I wouldn't necessarily. It's probably a good, PCA would perhaps be good to data mine, get an idea of what's there, and then kind of maybe validate with standards as well or yeah kind of yeah, depends this, on the, the data yeah and the standards are also linked to the cartridge slater cross section so when you do the actual mapping it's actually fitting it it's actually quantifying the data at the same time so you actually end up with something that uh, is proportional to the number of atoms present in the material rather than just a, a raw number yeah so I think as well we showed any we showed um, do I even have that data? So we showed data where it's super easy to interpret that um, wherever we were. Uh, yeah, so you remember what the screen plot looked like. So this is a different screen plot, and again this this one is not the worst screen plot I've ever seen, but this could be more typical of uh, eels data where you have this gradual uh change so it's not necessarily super clear at which point you're 
throwing it. You have to be careful with the PCA not to throw away real components, I think, in the fuels. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. Hmm. So the, the standards also work for our EDS software. So our EDS software uses standards in a similar way. You can uh, 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 acquire uh, peak positions, peak uh, shapes, and add that in as a standard for EDS analysis as well. All right, anything else? Uh, I think. I think that, that's all I've got, really. I saw Mike Kudman in the audience. Mike, you got any questions? Come on, you're... Kind of you to ask, right? I just, uh, <laughs> you may recall that I saw your presentation last year, so some of this was familiar. Uh, it's nice to see the further additions. OK. Yeah, I'm not picking on you, Mike. I just. Uh, it was always it was always fun to do this live because then you know you could actually see people and you, I could always tell when you're just about to ask a question and I could you know, it was always always very. Well, good. If it makes you feel any better, I, I gave Jonathan lots of questions yesterday about CL. Yeah, yeah, and that was yeah, that was very interesting to be able to you know do that back and forth. Okay, well, all right. So if that. Uh, I guess we're. This is also uh, recorded, so you can uh, go back and find the find all the mistakes that we made, <laughs> or, uh, or or review what we saw, share it with your friends, um, and you know if you do have any questions, uh, you know all these tools are in the help file, um, so you know if you forget exactly where all the buttons are, um, the help file kind of breaks everything down. It also usually has the math behind all of this. On how it's being calculated, and of course, you know, you can give send it, drop us a line, and ask us about this. Um, offline GMS uh, for data analysis is available on the website. Um, most of the features are free in the offline version. Uh, currently, there's a special COVID-19 version where basically everything is unlocked, so that uh, if you do want to, you know, if you have to work from home, you can't get to your lab computer you have access to EELS analysis, EDS analysis, FTEM analysis, uh, those sort of things, all on the uh, free site. So if you just look on our the GATAN website, uh, it's available to download. Kudos to GATAN for doing that. That's, that's really great. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. All right. OK, well, I wish everybody a good evening. Uh, enjoy the Milwaukee. Uh, uh, baseball games or uh, stroll along Lake Michigan or um, whatever it is people would have been doing in Milwaukee if we weren't here, uh, uh, separated from each other. And uh, hopefully we can do this in person next year. It'd be great. Indeed. Looking forward to it. It was a great demo. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.